Imagine a nation deciding to wage war on its own geography, to stare into the vast, sun-scorched, fiery red heart of a continent and decide, we're going to drown it. This isn't science fiction. This is the story of Australia's $200 billion gamble. A plan to create a colossal inland sea. A man-made Mediterranean in the middle of the world's driest inhabited continent. A project so audacious, it would have fundamentally re-engineered the climate of an entire landmass, turning a EI desert into an oasis. It sounds like a script torn from a blockbuster movie, a fusion of epic sci-fi and environmental thriller. But the most shocking part? Internal documents and modern proposals reveal that this dream, once declared dead, has been secretly revived. Armed with futuristic technology, some now argue this mega project is not just a fantasy, but Australia's last desperate hope against the catastrophic droughts that threaten its very existence. The question is no longer, can we do it? But should we? Would creating this sea save a continent, or would it unleash an ecological catastrophe from which it could never recover? This is the story of Australia's most audacious, most controversial, and perhaps most dangerous idea. A plan to literally reshape a continent. Before we dive into this continental scale gamble, if you're fascinated by the limits of human ambition and the future of our planet, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Your support helps us tackle these giant stories and trust me, you won't want to miss where this one goes. The strange thing is, the architects of this dream were, perhaps unconsciously, trying to turn back the hands of geological time. Because what many people don't realize is that an inland sea wasn't a new idea for Australia. Nature got there first. 140 million years ago, during the age of dinosaurs, a vast shallow ocean called the Aromanga Sea covered a massive portion of central Australia. This was a vibrant, prehistoric world teeming with life. Giant marine reptiles like the Kronosaurus, apex predators the size of a bus, hunted in these waters, alongside colossal squid-like creatures called ammonites. For millions of years, Australia's heart wasn't a desert, it was an ocean. The fossils of these sea monsters are still being dug out of the red dust today, ghostly reminders of a water world that once was. So when modern dreamers looked at the arid outback, they weren't just seeing a wasteland to be conquered. They were seeing a ghost, a memory of water they were determined to bring back to life. Our modern story begins in the 1800s. European explorers, raised on tales of great inland African and American rivers, plunged into Australia's interior, convinced they would find the same. Men like Captain Charles Sturt led expeditions into the Red Centre, chasing a mirage. They were searching for a fabled great river, a liquid highway that would unlock the continent. Instead, they found a brutal reality. Endless plains of shimmering salt, cracked earth, and a scorching silent heat. Sturt wrote in his journal of a land that felt broken, as if some great convulsion had torn these regions asunder. He found no sea, only a vast, dry depression. But the dream he was chasing refused to die with his discovery. It simply went dormant waiting for its champion. That champion arrived in the 1930s. His name was John Bradfield, a man whose name was already etched in steel and stone as the chief engineer of the iconic Sydney Harbour Bridge. Fresh from conquering Sydney's harbour, Bradfield set his sights on a far grander challenge, conquering the desert itself. He unveiled what would become known as the Bradfield Scheme, a vision of engineering so bold it bordered on madness. His plan was to harness the immense power of Australia's tropical north, where during the monsoon season, colossal amounts of fresh water flood from rivers and pour uselessly into the sea. Bradfield proposed to capture this water. He designed a breathtaking network of massive dams, powerful pumping stations, and a web of canals stretching over 2,300 kilometers. This intricate plumbing system would divert the floodwaters south forcing them inland against their natural course to fill the very depression Sturt had found, the Lake Eyre Basin. This basin is a geological marvel, a natural sinkhole 15 meters below sea level. Filling it would create a permanent inland sea larger than the nation of Belgium. This wasn't just about irrigation. 
Bradfield argued his sea would act as a massive climate engine. The vast body of water would, he claimed, cool the searing heat of the outback, generate enormous amounts of hydroelectric power, and most importantly, increase rainfall across the continent, creating lush new farmlands to rival the agricultural heartlands of California. It was a vision of terraforming on a scale never before attempted. To understand the obsession, you need to understand the geography. Think of the Australian outback as a gigantic shallow bathtub. The Lake Air Basin is the drain, covering a fissy, staggering 1.2 million square kilometers, or nearly a fifth of the entire continent. It is an endohiac basin, a fancy term meaning water flows in, but it has no natural outlet to the sea. On the rare occasions, perhaps once a decade, when massive monsoonal rains sweep across the north, rivers like the Diamantina and Cooper Creek surge with life. This water embarks on a slow, meandering journey south. And weeks, or even months later, it finally spills into Lake Eyre, transforming the salt-crusted wasteland into a temporary shimmering oasis, a haven for millions of birds. Bradfield's plan was to take this temporary miracle and make it permanent. But to do so, he had to overcome three titans guarding the desert. The first was volume. To fill Lake Eyre and keep it full would require an unimaginable 300 cubic kilometers of water. That is the equivalent of 600 Sydney harbors. The second and more relentless enemy was evaporation. In the brutal outback summers, where temperatures soar past 40 degrees Celsius, the sun is merciless. It would suck water from the surface of the sea at a rate 10 times faster than any local rainfall could replace it. The sea would be in a ACC, constant state of bleeding water back into the sky. And the third titan was salt. As water evaporates, it leaves its salt behind. Without an outlet to flush this salt away, the inland sea would grow progressively saltier year after year, eventually becoming a hypersaline, toxic dead sea, sterilizing everything it touched. For all its grandeur, Bradfield's sea would only be a fraction of the size of the Caspian Sea. Yet the task was akin to filling 12 billion Olympic-sized swimming pools and then trying to keep them topped up with a garden hose in the middle of a furnace. Despite the colossal challenges, the plan captivated a nation gripped by the Great Depression. Politicians sold it as a jobs miracle, a way to put thousands to work and build a legacy for the future. Farmers, plagued by Australia's infamous cycle of drought and flood, dreamed of a future with reliable water. For a time, it seemed inevitable. But by the 1940s, the dream began to crumble under the weight of two stubborn opponents, physics and mathematics. Independent engineers ran the numbers, and the results were damning. They calculated that evaporation would drain the sea far faster than Bradfield's canals could ever hope to fill it. The project would be in a perpetual water deficit, requiring more and more river water just to stay alive. Then came the cost. Initial estimates ballooned, with some figures reaching an astronomical $200 billion in today's money, a sum that dwarfed any project Australia had ever conceived. Finally, a new awareness began to dawn, tampering with entire river. Systems on this scale was not without consequence. It would devastate the fragile downstream ecosystems and threaten the indigenous communities who had lived in harmony with the river's natural cycles for tens of thousands of years. The final. Nail in the coffin came from halfway around the world. In the 1960s, the world watched in horror as the Soviet Union's own grand terraforming project turned into one of history's worst ecological disasters. The Aral Sea, once the fourth largest lake in the world, was drained to irrigate cotton fields. It shrank by 90%, its shores receding to reveal a toxic wasteland of salt and pesticide-laced dust. The fishing industry collapsed and toxic dust storms plagued the health of millions. The Aral Sea became a ghost lake, a terrifying monument to human hubris. Australia took note. The Bradfield scheme was quietly shelved, a grand but failed dream. But dreams of that magnitude never truly die. Fast forward to our time. Climate change is no longer a future threat. For Australia, it is a brutal present reality. The droughts are becoming hotter, longer, and more terrifying. 
The black summer of 2019 to 2020 saw the nation burn on an unprecedented scale, with entire towns running out of drinking water. In this desperate new reality, the old dream has been reborn, but with a futuristic twist. Enter the Inland Sea 2.0. The new proposals are different. Instead of diverting precious freshwater rivers, the plan is to pump water directly from the ocean. The vision involves building massive solar-powered desalination plants on the coast. These plants would use the outback's most abundant resource, sunlight, to produce vast quantities of fresh water, or in some proposals, simply pump seawater directly, 600 kilometers inland through colossal pipelines. Supporters argue this solves several problems at once. Using salt water might actually reduce evaporation rates. The immense new sea would create its own microclimate, generating lake effect rainfall for hundreds of kilometers around, greening the desert, and powering the whole thing with renewable energy would make it a landmark of sustainable mega-engineering. But the critics are just as vocal. The cost remains mind-boggling, with pipelines alone projected to cost over $200 billion. Pumping saline water into the heart of the continent would create a new set of ecological nightmares, permanently sterilizing the soil and groundwater for millennia. And then there is the deepest, most profound hurdle of all. The Lake Air Basin is not an empty wasteland. To the Arabana people, it is known as Katithanda, a sacred place central to their culture, spirituality, and dreaming stories, which are passed down through generations. To deliberately flood it would be an act of cultural destruction. So let's play God for a moment. What would actually happen if the project got a green light tomorrow? Within the first year, as pumps worked relentlessly, the basin would fill to 30% capacity, creating a shallow, brilliant turquoise jewel visible from orbit. By year three, salinity would begin to spike, dramatically altering the water's chemistry. By year five, the first tentative microclimate changes would be observed, with rainfall increasing by up to 15% in a 100-kilometer radius. New opportunistic life might begin to colonize the shores. By year 10, you might see the rise of coastal-style boomtowns, a surreal sight in the deep outback, sparking a bizarre real estate gold rush. But by year 50, the true consequences would be revealed. The ecosystem would face a stark choice, either collapse entirely under the weight of hypersalinity, creating a vast sterile salt pond, or just maybe it would stabilize, creating a new and unique biosphere, a bizarre hybrid of ocean and desert unlike anything else on Earth. There is a precedent for such a dramatic transformation. Five million years ago, the Mediterranean Sea evaporated almost completely in an event known as the Mycenaean Salinity Crisis. It became a deep, hot, dry basin of salt. Then, the Atlantic Ocean burst through the Strait of Gibraltar in a cataclysmic flood, refilling the entire basin in as little as two years. The result was a massive explosion of biodiversity. Could Australia's inland sea trigger a similar, albeit artificial, renewal? It's a tantalizing possibility. But the Mediterranean refilled naturally. Australia's scheme would depend on a fragile, artificial lifeline of pumps and pipelines, a wall of technology holding back the relentless advance of the desert. The latest visions from architects and engineers are even more futuristic. They imagine self-sufficient solar cities ringing the new sea, with Dubai-style skyscrapers rising from the red dust. They see algae farms floating on the water's surface, producing biofuel, and vast mining operations harvesting the accumulating salt for export. But this is where the dream collides with reality. The technology, like efficient, cheap graphene, filters for desalination, is still on the horizon, not yet ready for this scale. And the ethical question looms largest. As Arabana elder Aaron Stewart has stated, Our stories are written in this land. You can't drown them. In a nation already struggling with indigenous poverty and disadvantage, spending billions on a project that would desecrate a sacred site feels, to many, like the height of colonial arrogance. It's like throwing a lavish party while your neighbors are starving. In the end, Australia's Inland Sea Project is a Rorschach test for a nation's soul. 
Is it a bold, visionary solution to a climate crisis? Or a reckless, colonialist fantasy? It speaks to one of humanity's oldest, most powerful urges. The desire to conquer nature. To bend it to our will. To write our own story onto the face of the planet. Will it ever happen? In our lifetime, probably not. The financial, ecological, and ethical hurdles are simply too high. But as the droughts worsen, as the rivers run dry, and as the fires burn hotter, do not be surprised when this impossible dream once again resurfaces from the depths of the Australian psyche. After all, what is more Australian than a story of a great gamble against impossible odds? So, I leave you with this. Is this project a necessary act of survival for a continent on the brink? Or is it an unforgivable act of arrogance? Is the potential reward of a green heartland worth the undeniable risk of creating a dead one? Let me know your verdict in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Stay curious.